Paradox Interactive. It's the grand strategy Swedish gaming giant that we love to hate and hate to love. Paradox is a developer and publisher known for all sorts of nerdy games from beloved series like Crusader Kings, Europa Universalis, Hearts of Iron, to more controversial releases. That's not even to mention all the DLCs. Besides for that, Paradox is responsible for a lot of my most beloved and cherished gaming moments. And despite a lot of their controversies past and present, I can't help but hold something of a soft spot in my heart for them. If you're as much of a map painting nerd as I am and you've ever had the thought of how did Paradox even become a thing, that's what we're here to find out. This video is about the entire history of Paradox Interactive, from all of their lowest lows to all of their highest highs. Starting from the 1980s with their current day CEO literally selling pirated games in Sweden as a teenager, all the way up to today and beyond. If you're ready to unravel the paradox of Paradox, then and let's get started. If you want to pull a paradox and build your own digital empire this 2024, maybe even want to be a content creator or do something like I do, you should take it from me that just having any old standard URL in your bio just makes you look like a peasant. Okay, I'm just kidding. But if you want to level up your social media game and finally become the standout creative artist, influencer, or anything else you've wanted to be, do, or build online, it's a lot easier to do that thanks to the sponsors of today's video, Porkbun, and their brand new .bio link and bio hosting bundle. It includes both a custom .bio domain name, letting you pick your very own memorable URL, and it also includes Porkbun's powerful link and bio builder. You can customize and design your very very own space to keep all your links in one spot, password protector links, and so much more. And right now, if you follow my link in the description or pinned comment below, you can get your own custom .bio domain name and Porkbun's link and bio tool for only $5 for the whole first year. Thanks again to Porkbun for sponsoring this video and making insanely long videos like this one even possible. We'll get started by setting our time machines back to the year 1980. Imagine a world where the internet didn't exist, where the highest charting artists are Michael Jackson, Pink Floyd, and Queen, and Apple actually made products worth buying. Starting off in the year 1980, the predecessor to Paradox Interactive was just started, a company called Adventure Spiel, I, which translates to adventure games. Sorry for butchering that Swedish. Adventure Spiel. They launched adventure games at first in 1980 so that they could export games from the US and places like it over to Sweden. So the founder of adventure games, Frederick Malmberg, went over to the US to find the best war games there, set up distribution, and get the Swedes their fix of tabletop combat. But his plans completely changed when he noticed something. Something important. Dungeons and Dragons. It was wildly popular over in the US. I mean, among the sort of people who would play tabletop RPGs back then. And Malmberg thought, what if we made Dungeons and Dragons, but made it a new game without rules he considered to be obsolete and inferior? <laughs> that's a real quote. And published it for a Swedish audience. So that's exactly what Adventure Games decided to do. And by the year 1982, they had their own own brand new game on their hands called Drakkar och Demeter. It translates to dragons and demons. and it became a pretty big success for them. It spawned the whole genre of tabletop RPGs in Sweden, and it stuck in the collective unconscious for years. Even just this past year in 2023, there was a successful fan-made Kickstarter to fully re-release Dragons and Demons with an updated rule set and an English translation, which I, I think is great. After Dragons and Demons gained some traction, Adventure Games published it and they kept on up updating it throughout the 80s and 90s. And in the meantime, they also released more tabletop RPGs. Games like Mutant and Mutant Chronicles and Cult, a horror role-playing game that, quoting from the Wikipedia, features philosophical and religious depth along with mature and controversial content. By the late 
1990s, despite all the success Target Games had publishing, developing tabletop RPGs and stuff, Target Games hit a pretty rough financial snag, leading to its insolvency. The company would have to go bankrupt. But as a part of Target Games bankruptcy, a new company was bought out from the ruins, like a phoenix rising from the ashes. They called it Paradox Entertainment. They would pick up the interactive part of that name later. Before Target Games went under, they began trying to expand into several other businesses. Besides for expanding into a number of physical locations and releasing translations of the Lord of the Rings and Star Wars tabletop RPGs, eventually they had the bright idea to also start expanding into the then very early days of the PC gaming market, grabbing some developers like Johan Andersen, who still works at Paradox to this day. We all love Love you, Johan. They got these developers to make video game adaptations of their most successful board games. Before their split from Target Games, Paradox was already working on some of our favorite titles, like the first Europa Universalis, which we will cover in a bit. You get the point, Embattled Board Games Company goes bankrupt, and their video game division splits off. That video game division becomes Paradox and I guess starts taking over the entire gaming industry, like any decent map painter would be want to do. But it still wasn't quite as simple as that. Paradox was ambitious, sure, but the early days were a lot more about finding their footing. Their very first game was a title called Sevea Break, and today I actually have a surprise. I have a full version of Sevea Reich working on my computer that I'll try out and play live on this video. Exciting moment, everyone. This is Paradox's very first game. Get ready to be amazed. Okay, I, I can't understand any of this. It's all in Swedish. I don't I don't know why I did this, honestly. <laughs> it's it's pretty cool though. Kinda scrunkly. Anyways. After the release of Sphere Reich, and after it saw some modest success, and also after releasing titles like Sphere Reich 2 and Ararax Dogfighter, for some reason, Paradox moved on to their first big project. A game that would forever define them for time immemorial. And I'm talking about Europa Universalis. Never has there been such a time in such a place, and never shall it be so again. Europa Universalis, some people may know, was originally designed as a board game. Europa Universalis was originally designed by a genius French designer named Philippe Thibault and released as a board game all the way back in 1993, which like I know, imagine trying to play Europa Universalis with like pen and paper and dice rolls for every combat. When Target Games acquired rights to Europa Universalis for a video game adaptation in 1996, Target Games recognized it as an immeasurably complicated game with a ton of historical depth, interesting gameplay mechanics, and a lot of potential for a PC video game adaptation. The way it's described is that Target Games was trying to get some other developers to develop this game for them, and they tried working with a couple of other development teams before both of those attempts just failed. Maybe the game was just too complicated for them, and I wouldn't blame them. According to this article, the way Johan describes it is, I had played Svea Reich and heard that Target invested in games, and I myself had worked abroad in the game industry for a few years and wanted to go home to Stockholm. And then I liked Europa Universalis and thought, shit, I want to work on that. So I showed up at their office and they hired me after like two hours and I've been working with the EU ever since. I see a company is starting up in Sweden to make a game on that board game. Hey, I want to do that. 
So I moved here, and that's history. Philippe began working with Johan and Target Games as a whole on making their PC adaptation, and eventually after Target Games went under, the newly formed Paradox Entertainment was able to release the very first Europa Universalis right at the turn of the millennium in the year 2000. The release of Europa Universalis with the genius of Philippe and Johan, what's it called when they do the thing? Fusion dancing together. <laughs> put Paradox on a path of historical and strategy gaming dominance. Despite what I can now see with my modern eyes as a lot of technical limitations, especially compared to modern Paradox games, it was a huge release for Paradox Entertainment, and Europa Universalis 1 actually had a really positive critical reception too. IGN gave it a 9 out of 10, PC Zone praised it for its historical accuracy, for its various economic and diplomatic mechanisms, but it also warned people against its steep learning learning curve, and it criticized it for its average audio visuals. So really nothing's changed since then. Okay, I'm just kidding. Overall, it was a really successful release for them. And after this came a huge deluge of legendary, even more paradox-defining games. Just the very next year, in 2001, they had already released Europa Universalis 2, which was received even more positively. It almost won Computer Gaming's Strategy Game of the Year in 2002. After Europa Universalis 2 came the first Hearts of Iron in 2002. Hearts of Iron is now obviously its own legendary game series. Back when Hearts of Iron 1 released, it was still using the same Europa Universalis engine, and just a lot of its games gameplay features, and basically just a transposed setting into World War II. Hearts of Iron 1 definitely had more mixed reception when it was first released compared to Europa Universalis. Eurogamer gave it a 6 out of 10 for being hard to jump into and having inconsistent AI, and also the combat being kind of slow, saying the casual gamer should steer well clear. Somehow I feel like even still those sorts of reviews are exactly what Paradox wants to hear. But I digress. So that's Hearts of Iron 1. Also, it got banned in China. Anyways, afterwards, they released Europa Universalis Crown of the North in 2003, which was another Svea Reich sequel randomly. I guess they just named it a Europa Universalis game. That's still confused, but whatever. Then they released Victoria in 2003, again setting the tone for its series all the way back in 2003. Victoria was their first game where they really focused on more of an internal managing economy, trade, politics, things like that, more than diplomacy or war, which still makes other Paradox gamers upset to this day, but I digress. It was basically just based on the same Europa Universalis engine. Victoria maybe had the most non-positive reviews out of the four flagship Paradox franchises. On Metacritic, it only averaged a 58 out of 100. Victoria always started with the idea that it's supposed to be the smallest, narrowest scope gameplay-wise, and I guess them leaning into it really reinforced that, even for fans of other Paradox games, which is something to think about. Now, we're only missing the final flagship Paradox series, and stay tuned because we're almost about to get there. It's my favorite series after all. But just to wrap up the section of Paradox's history, with a bunch of generally successful releases under their belt and still going at a pretty steady rate, Paradox, in its quest to expand Band, and with pressure from its executives mounting, also started making some more, I'd call them questionable decisions. They published some more titles in this time period that, let's just say, didn't make the history books, from subpar RTS games like Chariots of War to forgettable RPGs like Valhalla Chronicles. It was a whole mixed bag. They also tried, and this is like crazy to hear about because they did it in 2003, they also tried and failed to make a massively multiplayer online FPS game in 2003. From what I could tell, they started the project, realized it'd take way too many resources to complete it to the finish line after already investing a bunch of resources into it, and 
they just canceled the project. When they canceled it, 30 developers were fired, a bunch of other staff members were laid off. It was bad. Paradox also began investing a bunch of money into buying some intellectual property rights, including the library of all things Conan the Barbarian, randomly. To quote Johan Anderson, the executives just invested the money they earned from these games into buying a bunch of brands. So in 2004, a lot of the people and management thought having all of these brands would be much cooler. So now we'll just own brands and make movies instead. Solid decision. And this decision making actually caused a pretty big rift in the company. There were two camps forming over at Paradox, largely made up of the difference between managers and developers, honestly, from what I can tell. One who, at all costs, wanted to go big or go home. And the other who really wanted to focus on their niche core audience of devoted, loyal strategy gamers. And this direction was put forward by none other than their current day CEO, Frederick Wester. He follows me on Twitter too, so what's up, my G, if you're watching? I feel so awkward right now. Frederick Wester, the man who would become the mastermind behind Paradox's transformation. Picture a young entrepreneur with a flair for gaming and a keen business sense. If you create a shit game for the PC, no one's gonna buy it. You can still sell a lot of shit games for the consoles. I'm not saying that console games are shit, but... According to this Polygon article, when Frederick was 15, growing up as a young boy interested in gaming, he realized, quote unquote, the best video games come from outside of Europe. <laughs> And so he and his brother began reselling games in Sweden. The thing is, I don't know if reselling is the right word. I don't think it is. All of their games were pirated. So, but then Nintendo got involved. They sent Frederick and his brother a cease and desist notice involving their mom and a lot of lawyers and two very confused teenagers being completely unaware that they did anything wrong. Or so they say. But still, they were young enough to not get into trouble and then everyone kind of just moved on. So after that, when Frederick joined Paradox, the company was right at its crossroads. What he saw was that their plan for AAA dominance wasn't going great. He said that Paradox should focus on their core audience, expand into publishing, and just let the creative juices flow from their developers. But the executives still disagreed, so... They split up. Paradox Entertainment actually closed down their computer games division altogether, now refocusing Paradox Entertainment into a company solely focused on managing the library of Conan the Barbarian. Ultimately a pretty funny and random decision to me. I don't, I don't know. And now, from the ashes of that second fire, rose up a new phoenix, Paradox Interactive. It's 2004. Now we're finally in the age of Paradox Interactive, thank god. Now able to actually set their own course, for real this time, they'd be able to finally stay true to the path that they knew would work for them. No more would they have to force their developers and staff to work on projects that weren't true to them anymore. At least in a way that still made them money, of course, like they're still a company. <laughs> money. As Frederick outlined in his business proposal, Paradox Interactive steered onto a new course. Gone were the days of overreaching. It was time to play to their strengths. And play to their strengths, did they? With their next release, the fourth and final flagship game, Crusader Kings in 2005. Crusader Kings was basically The Sims in a weird sort of way, with how character focused each interaction between realms was. Like you never interacted with a kingdom, you interacted with individual people who sometimes happen to control kingdoms. And I think that shift of perspective really does change a lot about how the game functions and feels. Crusader Kings was immediately seen as having a lot of potential and ambition, the type of game that was so novel in its focus of making a historical grand strategy with RPG elements that it still got thousands of people hooked on the idea, even in a pretty rudimentary way. IGN gave it a 7.6 
saying that Crusader Kings at least manages to offer something substantially different. The family mechanic definitely adds a lot of much needed personality to the series, but also saying that they should have included a tutorial and that there are too many obstacles in the way of actually enjoying the game. Crusader Kings 1 did also get a number of updates too, noticeably with the Deus of Volt update releasing a few years later to fix most of the most glaring QA issues with the Crusader Kings 1. Something that does make me feel a lot more sympathetic is learning about their publishing woes. It's even the whole reason why Paradox became a huge publisher in its own right. When Crusader Kings 1 is finally ready to be released in 2005, their North American publisher was a company called Strategy First, and after Crusader Kings 1 released, the company immediately went bankrupt. Literally two months after the game was published in North America, the company just completely went bankrupt. So if you're Paradox, what do you do? You still have an insane amount of orders to fulfill halfway across the earth, and you can't get the publisher to just publish the game because they don't exist anymore. So obviously what you do is you pack up the boxes themselves, stick on the shipping labels, and fulfill those orders, baby! <laughs> In 2004, we were just 12 people, I think. So we hand-packed all the envelope. It was 4,500 envelopes in three weeks. And so me and two other guys, we directly after work at 6 o'clock, we went to the warehouse here. And then we packed for a couple of hours, and then we went home. So that was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun as well. <laughs> I used to work at Amazon too. I, I know that pain way too well. Essentially, they're forced into being the publisher they are today. But this turn on the Wheel of Fortune would also serve them quite well in the long run. Because luckily for them, Paradox developers and staff members wouldn't have to personally be shipping out boxes for too much longer. Right around this time period is when downloading games and buying games over the internet and on digital marketplaces starts to become really popular, especially through digital distributors like Steam and later on through their own website, which I, I could not believe this when I first read it. They called it Gamer's Gate. <laughs> Obviously just a coincidence, but wow, was a foreshadowing if I've ever heard it. Paradox used their new publishing infrastructure they were forced to build up to strengthen its cash reserves while they developed future game releases. Magicka and Mountain Blade were their two big early successes. These are games with pretty broad appeal compared to Paradox gamers at the time. Even I remember playing Magicka when I was a kid. Magicka went on to sell 1.3 million copies after its release in 2011. Paradox Interactive saw a 250% increase in profits, and it also sold over 4 million DLC purchases later on, too. Order Magicka now! But important to mention, they didn't really have a great filter when they started publishing games. Some games were amazing, some others were just very low quality releases. Birth of America, a game so unremarkable that its entire Wikipedia page is shorter than the opening paragraph for this video. <laughs> Frederick Wester says, we signed some games that were just terribly bad. I don't even remember the names of those games. They also published weird games too. Poorly thought out ones like Gettysburg Armored Warfare. As weird as it sounds, it was literally a multiplayer futuristic Civil War AI combat sort of game. I, I have played it on the channel before if you want to see it out of morbid curiosity. It's really really weird. Gettysburg Armored Warfare specifically was a game that Paradox felt like they had to apologize for, which is funny hearing it now, but less funny when you're someone who bought a strange game because you had a positive opinion of Paradox and then got kind of stuck with what reviews called a busted, unfinished, and agonizingly incomplete game. If you don't mind, Fred, uh, are you a pathological liar? 
Now, that is the question of the day in the games industry, isn't mm. it? These early efforts taught them a lot. It taught them that their strategy had to begin evolving, especially to publishing, but to development too. Ensuring their games weren't just unique and niche and intricate, but also stable and mostly bug-free and enjoyable. <laughs> so backtracking to Paradox's mid-2000s, just to catch up on their releases in the meantime, Time. This is the time period when we start to see a bunch of sequels to Paradox's flagship series. It feels like this is Paradox really trying to cement their place in the strategy gaming world and very firmly say to the rest of the world, if you're one of the few who like it, you're with us. If you're not, go away. <laughs> Throughout the early 2000s, Paradox fills out its roster with a couple more Hearts of Iron releases, a few Europa Universalis releases. My girlfriend especially loves EU Rome. There are a couple of Victoria releases, including the much better received and still beloved Victoria 2, all by the end of 2010. A few more important things did also happen during this time period, such as Paradox going from their quote-unquote Europa Universalis engine, which wasn't actually an engine at all, as Johan clarifies. It's more that they just copy-pasted huge chunks of code from one game to the next. Eventually, they did turn it into an actual engine and allowed indie developers to use it totally for free by 2008, which is pretty cool of them, actually. When they developed their first real legit engine in 2007, Klausfit's engine, it allowed for a 3D world map and a lot of other quality of life improvements as well, especially over literally just copy pasting huge chunks of code from one game to another. Like I, I imagined even just that probably saved them a lot of time and energy. That fact really does show off just how Paradox was coming of age here. It's a huge difference from the earliest years of Paradox's history, where we see a young company that's making smaller scale games and turning them around once or twice a year. I think ultimately that is for very good reason. Games like Hearts of Iron 3 were fun fundamentally great, but just need more time to be polished before it's released to be truly great. I don't want to romanticize Paradox too much either. They're ultimately still a company that's looking to make more money as well, and they realize by increasing their quality of games, they could make more money too. It's just a notable shift in focus. <laughs> Now we're in my favorite era of Paradox's history. We're entering the 2010s now, and we're right past Victoria 2's release. I'll call it Paradox's golden era. I use my nostalgia talking, but this era just screams teenage years for me. Playing map painting games while coping with hating high school and stuff, you know, like a typical neurotypical teenage girl would do. <laughs> Complex, but not complicated, is our goal. And there's nobody else to consult or discuss it with because nobody else makes these types of games. That quote kind of goes hard, honestly. At this point, we get to talk about the greatest and most important game Paradox ever made. That's right, I'm talking about Sengoku. Yeah, do you remember Sengoku? No, you don't. <laughs> It was an interesting release. Basically CK2 in Sengoku Jirai. I'll never forget the send ninjas button either. <laughs> Now we get to talk about some actually important games. These two games released in 2012 and 2013 respectively are still some of my favorite games to this day. I'm talking about Crusader Kings 2 and Europa Universalis 4. Crusader Kings 2 is really my favorite game of all time, and E4 was even my most played game of 2023. So let's start with Crusader Kings 2. When Crusader Kings 2 was first released in 2012, it was huge for Paradox a good game, a promising game at release, but it was honestly lacking a lot of the later features Paradox would build on top of this foundation of a game over the years. Back in 2012, you couldn't play Muslim countries at all, I don't think. You were essentially limited to only feudal European countries, but just to really flesh it out as much as they could, I think this is where Paradox really started to DLC spam too. 
If you look at the timeline of CK2's DLC releases, you can tell just how quickly they added new features to this game, even over just the first couple of years. Especially compared to CK3, which we'll talk more about a bit later, and these were legit substantive DLCs too. Adding up to over 32 DLCs, expansion packs, and add-ons to really flesh out this deeply intricate, beautiful game that it evolved into at its final stage. I mean, they, they also padded Paradox's pockets, so they were happy to do it too. You're playing a game that's constantly going to get better, but that's also going to constantly ask more investment out of you as time goes on. Not that the developers don't deserve it, but it's almost like you're paying for a game as a sort of subscription service, which you can also now do for CK2 and EU4 and a bunch of other Paradox games. You want to pay $4.99 a month for everything CK2? Or do you want to spend a couple hundred on CA2 and all of its CLCs now? Like, you, you can choose that. You can talk about the developers working tirelessly to improve the state of a game that I love and I still cherish and adore. You also need to mention how much of a financial incentive there was for Paradox to do it too. It's a company, we live in capitalism, that's going to be their goal as a business. It is what it is. I can't even blame them, you know? It's still better in my mind when the releases actually contain legit content instead of having to pay for characters in Africa to actually be black. It's the good and the bad which I'm reconciling with here. As long as I mention both, I think it's a fair analysis. <laughs> Even if I absolutely love how this game was developed and expanded over the years. That CK2, still my favorite game of all time, was huge for Paradox for the entire rest of the 2010s up until CK3's release in 2020. The next year, 2013, also saw the release of Europa Universalis 4. Again, another game that I absolutely love and I play a bunch. My most played game last year, surprisingly. Europa Universalis 4 released in a similar sort of fashion to CK2 at first. Really promising base game still more polished compared to previous Paradox releases up to that point. And then, once they started releasing more DLCs and updates and expansions, throughout the years, EU4 became an incredibly well-balanced, incredibly well-developed IMO, a very thoroughly fleshed out game. Like, in my mind, Crusader Kings is the cute half roleplay, half diplomacy, warfare, whatever else sort of game, while EU4 is the purest war game. There's nothing like the feeling that comes from stack wiping someone's army after getting all the discipline and morale buffs you can manage with your goaded 434 general too. Or the rage that comes with losing a 13% siege to the Ottomans. It's always the Ottomans. Just look at that. What the hell? E4 has had even a more extended lifespan than CK2 was at at this point. E4's last DLC was released this past year, just in 2023, and while I'm sure we will see U5 come out at some point, potentially maybe even very soon, it's kind of wild that this game has stood the test of time for literally like a decade now. As I'm writing the script on January 4th, 2023, E4 still has over 20,000 people playing it on Steam, which is twice as many as Victoria 3, which is sad, but still, it's good for being Steam's 65th most played game by number of concurrent players. E4 is the LeBron James of video games, if you will. Like, no matter how old it gets, it just still keeps on cooking. The dorkiest thing I've ever said. LeBron James! But there's still one thing I'd be remiss to mention. These games didn't just become popular on their own, but right around when CK two and E4 was released is when we start seeing Paradox community actually become a thing and really take off too. I'm biased since it's literally my job now and thank you for that. YouTube channels who were playing Paradox games and then those channels taking off is legit a big part of why Paradox became the sort of gaming behemoth it is today. In a very symbiotic sort of way too. At the beginning we started to see a lot of creators making videos on Paradox games, mostly long form unedited stuff. People like Cool18, Arumba, people sort of in that same sort of vein, cultivating dedicated 
audiences and getting more people into Paradox Games as a whole. And later too, edited content from people like especially ISR Productions at first, made videos that were entertaining to people more broadly outside of the then established Paradox space. So the videos were actually as fun to watch as the games were to play, playing the groundwork for channels like me. Like for me, I wouldn't have been able to get into a game like Crusader Kings 2 if I wasn't watching people like them creating gameplay videos, making tutorials, and literally just sharing the stories and fun experiences they were having in these games that maybe I had never even thought of trying before I watched someone else play it. I'm gonna read a Quilletine Reddit comment. Paradox has always been extremely smart about grassroots level marketing in general and have been supportive of YouTubers in specific. I think it comes from self-publishing relatively niche games with a high level of complexity. You need people to form communities and share information about mechanics and strategy. All people who publish strategy games with high replayability need to do this. I've had literally hundreds of people tell me that. They've bought games, especially Paradox titles, because of my videos. So again, I don't really mean to give us as YouTube creators an outsized impact in this whole story or anything like that, and I especially don't want to play into the stereotype of YouTubers being self-obsessed, egotistical narcissists. That is all still absolutely true, but I don't want to feed it. <laughs> a lot of YouTubers are making great tutorials as well. So yeah. if you take Crusader Kings 2, you have a Roomba has a nine hour long tutorial of the mm -hmm. game where he goes through all the details so sometimes YouTube uh, influencers are better at describing the game than we are ourselves. Yeah. I would also be insane if I didn't mention the amazing impact the modding community has had on Paradox games and the Paradox community in general. Paradox has always invited people to mod their games as much as they could except for City Skylines 2 at release but whatever. With Paradox usually providing modding tools for their games at release and the modding community stepping up to add to Paradox games and all sorts of unique, interesting, and even just like additive quality of life enhancing sorts of ways. From minor gameplay and mechanics changes all the way up to huge massive total conversion mods, essentially making entirely different games out of the same game that we play. Like it's crazy. It gives me a lot of hope for humanity that people volunteer their time and talent to create such amazing works of art. There's been so many amazing high quality mods that have taken thousands of hours from thousands of people all over the Paradox community. So for anyone who's a modder, sincerely from the bottom of my heart, you all do amazing work. And maybe for anyone who's watching this and has played any mods that they've enjoyed, consider supporting their various ways of sending them tips that some of them have set up or however else they'd prefer to be supported to. Also, this is a great time to announce I will be a part of ModCon this year, a yearly community run event that showcases a ton of mods, raises a bunch of money for charity. It's currently planned to take place in April over the course of a few days of live streams, so I'll let you all know when I have more info about it. Now, after that quick diversion, let's get back to the actual Paradox timeline. So past the releases of CK2 and E4 are when we're basically in Paradox's modern era, I would say. Besides for March of the Eagles, a game that's so unremarkable, it's still memed about to this day, especially by YouTubers like me. Paradox's next two important releases came a few years later, both in 2016, with the release of Hearts of Iron 4 and Stellaris, two games that also still have a massively dedicated and loyal fan base to each of them, even to this day. So let's start with Hearts of Iron 4. Hearts of Iron 4 was released on June 6, 2016, and it was a huge commercial success for Paradox. It sold more than 200,000 units in its first two weeks of launch, and Oi4 currently has over 41,000 players on Steam, making it Paradox's still most concurrently played game on Steam out of any of their developed games. When Hearts of Iron 4 was released, 
it also had a great critical reception too. IGN gave it a 9 out of 10, giving it a ton of praise for being an intensely intricate, satisfying World War II simulator that was a huge improvement over Hearts of Iron 3. PC Gamer gave it an 88, calling it a beautiful, thrilling war game. It captivates me because imperfectly, impressionistically, and perhaps a little amorally, it lets me orchestrate the most titanic armed struggles in history. There are other great strategic level war games out there, but I have never played anything like Hearts of Iron 4. I, I couldn't agree more. And of course, Hearts of Iron 4's huge communities also spawned its whole massive YouTube genre as well. My homeboy Alex the Rambler has been cooking with Hearts of Iron 4 for years now. There's obviously plenty of other creators too, but he's my favorite one, so of course I'm going to mention him. <laughs> WayForce also had a bunch of DLCs and updates released over the past almost eight years at this point. It kind of goes without saying. Overall, I think it's fair to say that over the last decade, Way 4 has been pretty consistently the single most popular, well-known about Paradox game, at least in terms of overall attention. Hearts of Iron 4 may even be the prototypical Paradox game when people outside of the niche think about Paradox games at all. A lot of that outsider talk comes with controversy too, given the subject matter of World War II. You know, it's expected that fans of the series have a sort of weird reputation. And don't even get me started on TNO players. I'm just kidding, I love you. Despite all of that, ultimately, I do still think Hoi 4 deserves a lot of credit for bringing in a bunch more fans into the Paradox sphere and making a really impressive, detailed, intricate war game that still makes me tear my hair out every time I play it. It genuinely deserves a lot of respect. Everyone, please give Hoi 4 a round of applause. Good, good. Okay. And now, let's talk about Stellaris. Stellaris immediately set itself apart from basically every other Paradox game because it's about space. Maybe the worst kept secret in company history? Uh. Stellaris is the space game that we have been asked to make for the last decade at least. And it's of course a new and very exciting challenge for us because we're leaving history behind. It was legit a huge gamble to go for a sci-fi, spacefaring, 4x sort of game. Our ambition is to eventually cover the entire human timeline, including the future. Stellaris just fits right in line with Paradox's shared vision for the future of humanity or whatever. It was Paradox's biggest departure to that point and it paid off a new beginning full of possibility when Stellaris released in May of 2016, compared to Hearts of Iron 4 selling 200,000 units in two weeks, Stellaris sold 200,000 units in 24 hours completely smashing Paradox's revenue record for any Paradox-developed game. Still to this day, Stellaris is another one of Paradox's most popular games. It was another impressive release added to Paradox's ever-growing catalog of successful releases. It's great to have that sort of variety, with a massive cult following and a more chill community even though you can do some pretty messed up things in that game too. Look at that, we already have a coordinated fulfillment center here. This world will be exploited ruthlessly. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> As we move further into Paradox's more recent gaming history, we see Paradox expanding more and more as a large-scale business too, making more shrewd moves to build up their staff and resources and infrastructure, and doing what they can to grow their revenue as any corporation would. From opening up a bunch of new secondary developer studios in places like Berkeley and Barcelona, to going public in an IPO in 2016, to put Paradox on the stock market and bring in new investors, just very clear that the days of working with a handful of developers in the basement of some studio somewhere in Stockholm are long gone. When I started this journey at Paradox, it was 13 years ago. We were a small, insignificant indie developer, seven people. And since then, every year has been a new journey for Paradox. is both inspiring and a bit scary at the same time. 
during this time period, we also see Paradox as a publisher, publishing some of its biggest releases to date, too. Steady Skylines especially was huge. The game that literally dethroned SimCity as the go-to city builder. It sold over 12 million units across all platforms by 2022. Paradox also published a bunch of other games over this more recent time period that are thankfully a lot higher quality than the stuff they would have considered publishing in the past. Just to list them, Magicka 2, Pillars of Eternity, Prison Architect, Surviving Mars, Age of Wonders, Planetfall, and Age of Wonders 4, Tyranny, Surviving the Aftermath, Empire of Sin, and of course, City Skylines 2. I'm not going to go into all of these games, but these are all big additions to Paradox's portfolio as a publisher too. This most recent time period for Paradox, while coming with a lot of commercial success and business growth, also comes with some of the most serious controversy that Paradox has ever had. This time period comes with all the expectations that you'd have for a company that started off as a small developer studio to a massive multinational corporation that employs almost 700 people in-house and generated over $200 million of revenue only in the year 2022. On a corporate business level, Frederick Wester stepped down as the CEO of Paradox Interactive in 2018, being replaced by Ebba Lundgerud. I'm so sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Seems like it was more of a business operations restructuring sort of thing. I'm saying, I see more and more that we need someone who's experienced to take over an operation that is growing rapidly and has large visions to continue to grow. So basically, it was just a typical business restructuring sort of thing. This sort of thing does legit happen in businesses a lot, which makes it all the more awkward that she was only CEO for a few years before some disagreements about company strategy. It's hard for my map game addicted brain to not see this as the corporate equivalent of taking the claim throne perk in CK3. <laughs> Moving on to the much more serious and not fun controversy. In that same September 2021, it was reported that Paradox employees had an internal survey and found that 44% of the 133 respondents had reported some type of mistreatment at the workplace, including 69% of female respondents who said they had experienced abusive treatment. Some Paradox employees also shared some more personal, very upsetting encounters that happened to them. One Paradox employee reporting about her manager. He had too much physical contact with his female employees. A hand on the lower back or very close hugs or he drilled his face into one's throat. Said one woman who was harassed by the man before he was hired at Paradox. There is also a general criticism of a culture of silence going on at Paradox, where especially female employees would feel unable to report things, communicate disagreements, have equal creative input on projects. One employee saying they were told, you know what, you're just here as a token hire, so I think you should be quiet about this. Yeah, it's not, it's not a good look. Um... I don't really have a super smart video essay argument to lay out or anything like that. My take is just as someone who is a fan of Paradox games and who is a woman on the internet and who somehow plays Paradox games for a living, it's both genuinely not really surprising at all and yet still super gross and disappointing. Paradox is really lucky that Blizzard happened to have their own worst controversy going on at the same time that drowned out this news. I don't really have much else to say about it. At least it looks like they're addressing it publicly and they have a page on their website detailing the survey results. They have a commitment to crack down on sex behavior at Paradox, which is something, bare minimum, if I'm being honest, but it is something. That's about all I can say about it, really. So this is a tone shift and none of the other Paradox controversies I'm listening here are going to sound as serious because they're not. But 
The other paradox things that happen that also deserve mentioning are them deciding to release Imperator Rome in 2019 to some mildly positive reception, but mostly just quiet reception. Imperator Rome is a game set shortly after Alexander the Great's conquest of Persia and his shortly thereafter death. It honestly used a lot of new ideas combined with a lot of other ideas borrowed from Crusader Kings and other Paradox games like having individual rulers with 3D portraits, needing to worry about family opinions and things like that. It's genuinely a really unique game and it's clear that a lot of time and effort and energy were put in into it by the people who were working on it. Like, there was a lot of love behind it. And it was also clear that it was really just a secondary game that Paradox was working on. So unfortunately, in 2021, after only a couple years and a few updates, it was announced that Paradox wouldn't be developing it anymore, and because they didn't see much more community interest in it as a major game of theirs, leaving only modders like the Invictus team to continue on the torch of adding new features and expanding on the game of Imperator Realm. And I guess annoying YouTubers like Leith trying to bring it back to you. <laughs> Whoo! Okay, we just got done with the Imperator event. I think we peaked at, I think, 1300 plus. Uh, and yeah, awesome guys. <laughs> it wasn't just Imperator as well. In September 2021, busy month for them, Jesus. Paradox also announced they were canceling a bunch of other game projects to focus on their proven niches. Honestly, kind of fair enough given their tried and true formula. Reminds me a lot of Frederick's suggesting they do the same thing way back in 2004. And finally, we'd be missing out if we didn't mention whatever's going on with Vampire the Masquerade Bloodline 2. Paradox is cyberpunk, I guess. I don't really understand everything that's going on. I don't know a lot of the context or history. I'll just give you the cliff notes. In 2015, Paradox acquired the rights for Vampire the Masquerade Bloodline 2. In 2016, development was started. In 2018, the lead writer left. In 2019, the game was delayed. In 2020, the entire leadership team was let go and the game was delayed again. In 2021, the game switches developers and is delayed again. Very little substantive has come out since then. For a triple game as complex as this game is supposed to be, that's not good. Like, that's that's all I have to say about it. We're just, we're just gonna move on. With all of that being said, it's not like this time period was all bad or anything. The one really bright spot during all this time period of recent controversy was another one of my favorite games being released, Crusader Kings 3. Crusader Kings 3 is the long-awaited follow-up to Crusader Kings 2. When it was released in September 2020, it was a huge bright spot to people like me in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic for a bunch of gamers like me to hyperfixate on something while the world was doing whatever it was doing back then. And I think it did a really good job of building on top of the foundations that Crusader Kings 2 laid out over the past decade before then. Crusader Kings 3 was legit a huge improvement over its predecessor Crusader Kings 2. In terms of having a vastly improved engine, the game just ran so much better. Improved high quality 3D models, which I still think look really good. An improved tutorial, an improved UI, a less insane learning curve, and an overall easier to get into strategy experience without losing any of the core complexity. I still think Crusader Kings 3 has a long way to go in adding in all of the depth and as many of the features that Crusader Kings 2 had over its, you know, almost decade-long time period. It's not really a fair comparison, but I do think they've genuinely done a really good job in the past year or two of really adding a lot to the world of Crusader Kings 3, getting the community re-engaged, adding a bunch of new gameplay elements like a travel system. And the other thing I like about it is that while they are adding a lot of new features, Features and starting to create more DLCs and expansions like I wanted them to. They're also doing it in a way that's different from Crusader Kings 2. They recognize that it's a different game and the things that 
you would want to add to a game like CK3 are inherently different in a lot of ways. I think it's exactly the right approach. We'll see where CK3 goes from here. There was a time where after the release of CK3, we were hardly seeing any updates for like a solid year or two. I almost felt kind of neglected by Paradox as a fan of the series. I don't know if that means I'm spoiled or not, but I'm, I'm glad Paradox has been giving it a lot more development time and attention and communicating with the community more recently. And I'm actually pretty hopeful for the future of CK3. I think, I think it's going in a good direction. Now, to a game that had a much more controversial release for Paradox, Victoria 3. From day one, when Victoria released in 2022, it went against the grain of everything that made Victoria 2 work for the somehow still thriving Victoria 2 community that had built up over the years. And I do get the frustration too, because Paradox wanted to make a game that appealed to a broader gaming niche than the community that had built up around Victoria 2. So for the community that was still interested in playing Victoria 2, it must have hurt to see Paradox going in a different direction than what they wanted. Deliberately choosing to make a sequel that, especially in terms of the warfare system, felt very misaligned to what they were looking for out of A Victoria 3. I personally, and again this is my opinion, people get upset with me about this, but still it's just my opinion, I liked playing Victoria 3 more than Victoria 2. I just, I did. Biased opinion ever. But it's still my opinion. Overall, the fans of Victoria 2 really disliked it. It was seen as kind of meh by the rest of the Paradox community, I think. It's certainly not my favorite Paradox game ever anyways. I guess the moral of the story is that you really do need to know your target audience. Recently, Paradox has updated Victoria 3 to have a real warfare system, apparently. It's still good to see Paradox giving Victoria 3 attention, and not that they're just giving up on it immediately like they did with Imperator. It is a sign that they're willing to listen to the community that actually wants to play Victoria games. Oh my god, I'm so tired. But now we're basically at the current day of Paradox Interactive, and there's just a few more things to cover. Paradox Interactive, at the tail end of 2023, published City Skylines 2, a sequel to the wildly successful City Skylines 1, to a lot of controversy that I even talked about on the channel myself, including really poor performance at launch, the lack of any type of mod support, and a general consensus, both among game critics and a general audience, that it's a good game in theory, it just needs a lot more time to to truly be the game it's meant to be. Colossal Order is, to be completely fair, getting there. Their most recent major update did include a lot of performance improvements, which I have tried and it's taken City Skylines 2 from a game that's pretty hard to run on my computer and stream and record at the same time to a game that makes it a lot easier. It's still a bit shaky, but but it's manageable. Like, you, you, I can actually do it now. As of writing this and recording this, there still isn't any word on when true modding support will be added, and I'm still pretty sad that they're refusing to use the Steam Workshop for their mods too, especially when it was such a big part of where the modding community was for City Skylines 1. But I'm sure they'll get to a pretty good place eventually, and hopefully sooner rather than later. I really need Traffic Manager. <laughs> oh my god, do I need Traffic Manager? Now we get to talk about the future of Paradox. Paradox also has a lot of other things coming in the future too. First, a game called Life by You, which is aiming to be a Sims competitor. It looks like it's a typical role-playing sort of management game. The graphics look kind of scuffed at the moment, but it is refreshing for EA to have some legit competition backed up by a publisher as big as Paradox is. Will it actually overtake the Sims in popularity is a whole nother thing. I kind of find it hard to believe it'll be as easy for them as it was with SimCity and City Skylines. I guess we'll have to wait to see. 
There's also Millennia, which is more of a Sid Meier Civilization type game, which is also planned to release in 2024. It does still look interesting. It covers the whole range of human history, including a lot of ages like the age of rogue AI. Spooky. And again, we'll have to wait to see if it's able to actually be a competitor with a game like Civilization 6 or not. Like, I, I kind of doubt it more. For the future of Paradox 2, if I can roleplay as Kara Stradamus for a second, I'd wager that we'd honestly probably hear an announcement for Europa Universalis 5 and Hearts of Iron 5 before Grand Theft Auto 6 releases. I promise I don't actually have any insider info to confirm or deny one way or the other, and I can't really base it on much other than a hunch knowing Paradox, because they're probably working on both of those games right now. Feel free to let me know in the future if I was correct or not. I don't, I don't know. We'll see. As we look towards the future, Paradox Interactive stands at the forefront of the strategy gaming world. Where they choose to go from here is really up to them. Like years from today, will we be talking about a Paradox that learned from its past controversies and mistakes? Still beloved, large-scale gaming corporation now? Or will they just become another EA? Like, obviously, I hope not, but it could go either way. They could go bankrupt tomorrow. Like, I, who knows? I think the more important thing on reflecting on Paradox's entire journey is that it's not even really just about the games they've made. It's about the community they've fostered and the impact they've had on the gaming world. They've shown that strategy games can be both challenging and immensely enjoyable, while also providing a lot of people, myself obviously included, a huge outlet for creative expression. Their games have given so many of us a chance to become involved in a vibrant community of fantastic people who can share their dorky passions with each other and ultimately make the world a little bit brighter for each of us in it. Paradox Games and the community as a whole have seriously been such a huge part of my life and it's been an honor to be a part of it. If you're here and you're watching this, thank you so much. It really means everything to me. Anyways, thank you for joining me on this very deep dive of Paradox Interactive. Thank you a bunch to Porkbun and Dot Bio for sponsoring this video. Make sure to check out their offer in the description if you want to get a great deal on building your own link in bio today. Totally forgot to include this in the video. I also owe a huge shout out to the guy with a hat for helping me edit the script of this video. It's a huge script, so I really appreciate the help. If you could go check out his channel, it would mean a lot to both of us. Thank you a bunch to the channel members too for supporting this video and for everything. I wish you all a fantastic 2024. Mwah. <laughs>